taking your valuable time on a weekend afternoon to attend. You know, through all the years uh, of hosting these conferences, this year feels to me like the darkest. We face the terrible Israeli Gaza war, the continuing conflict between Russia and Ukraine, elected officials across the nation trying to actively undermine democratic governance, a military budget that represents more than half of our income tax going to the war machine. In fact, if you calculate it correctly and take the 143 billion Veterans Administration, which is a true cost of war, but is put in the civilian budget, move that over to the military budget where it should be. It's more than 60% of total discretionary spending uh, going to the war machine. Meanwhile, the government is going forward with a truly insane $2 trillion program to modernize all three legs of the nuclear weapons triads, which will render the planet even more awash with nuclear warheads. Now, some have argued that more than 70 years have passed without further use of nuclear weapons. But as Martin Luther King Jr. so cogently pointed out, the bombs dropped on Vietnam fall at home in the form of undermining the civilian economy. The Poor People's Campaign has made clear that many of the 140 million Americans living near or below the poverty line are domestic casualties of the war economy. All right, so even without these bombs blowing up, they do their damage. In fact, many of the million Americans who died from the coronavirus over the last few years were really victims of public health and health care programs drained of the needed funding. This in order to ensure the super profits of the weapons industry. However, as long as we maintain organizations and institutions that can mobilize for peace, diplomacy, and human needs, we can keep a candle of hope lit. Uh, in that spirit, I want to say a few words about this particular conference. After the Manhattan Project wound down at the end of World War II, a group of influential physicists came to MIT. Among them were Bernard Feld, Henry Kendall, Philip Morrison, Randy Forsberg, Kosta Sippus, Vera Kistiakowski, and Aaron Bernstein. And these physicists established an informal program of nuclear disarmament. Not peace, just nuclear disarmament. And MIT emerged as one of the national centers of advocacy for nuclear disarmament. Bernard, Bernie Feld helped establish the bullet in atomic scientists. Henry Kendall launched the Union of Concerned Scientists. It was in meetings of Philip Morrison, Randy Forsberg, and Costa Sippus. It was around the corner from my office that the nuclear weapons freeze campaign was launched. Um, luckily, the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts elected to have the MIT Episcopal Chaplaincy support that program, and that provided some critical political protection. Well, with the passing away of most of the original leaders, this conference has morphed from a primarily MIT event to a broader national conference directed by a diverse nuclear disarmament coordinating committee. Numerous organizations advocating peace and nuclear disarmament, including Code Pink, Our Revolution, Mass Peace Action, PSR, etc., uh, participate in the organizing and are listed at the end of the program. I want to thank particularly Amanda Nichols of Our Revolution, Nicholas Kalura of MIT Radius, and Cole Harrison of Mass Peace Action for their help. Now, everybody here knows that the U.S. has a long history of the destructive use of gunboat diplomacy. But today's gunboats can be armed with nuclear warheads. With the U.S. and other nations keeping thousands of nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert, the nuclear-armed nations, which include Israel, are taking humanity down a dangerous road. And we have to make clear to our fellow citizens that the enormous expenditures of preparing for such a war, even if it's not launched, will only continue to undermine civilian programs our people desperately need. Um, <laughs> there are at least two beacons on the horizon, both the passage of the Biological Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention, a testimony that nations can agree to desist from the use of entire classes of weaponry. So the first beacon is the entry into force of the tr treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, which opens up a new chapter in the effort to rid the world of nuclear weapons. Long way to go, but at least there's a path. Second, the engagement of young people all across the country uh, 
in the opposition to Israel's continuing attacks on Gaza indicate the emergence of a new social force in the struggle for peace and justice, somewhat similar to what happened in the resistance to the Vietnam War. Now, over the next few hours, we'll have two plenary sessions, followed by breakout sessions from four to five. Um, the breakout sessions are meant to be working meetings to set priority and plans for those participating heading into the coming year. After the breakout session, do come back. We will hold a closing plenary featuring some of the most active grassroots campaigns underway. And hopefully all of this will send a clear message to the president, to the Congress, to our friends and neighbors, to pull back from the brink of unnecessary and unsound military confrontation and continuing militarization at home. Now it's my pleasure to turn over the chair to my longstanding colleague, Susan Mursky, chair of uh, Mass Peace Action's very active and longstanding nuclear disarmament working group. Susan, take us away. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, you know, you have really said it all uh, in talking about the dangers of nuclear weapons uh, and perhaps what we can do about it. So uh, let's just get on with uh, introducing our first panel. I just want to do a little lay of the land for you all. Uh, each presenter will have eight minutes and after that, we'll have four minutes for questions. So please put your questions in uh, the reaction button, the Q and A, uh, and your reaction button down at the bottom, uh, which will really help me because I will not have, uh, I, I don't have the ability <laughs> to look through chat for your questions. So please, Please, we want to get to as many questions as we can. So please put them in the form of questions and uh, then also raise your hand. Uh, and then for questions again, please put them in form of a question so that our presenters can best answer them. Um, we have the, uh, the wonderful, uh, advantage of having four excellent speakers today. The first, we have Alan Robach, just to let you know, Alan Robach, David Boris, Medea Benjamin, and Trita Parsi. Starting with Alan Robach, Alan is a distinguished professor of client science in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He earned a PhD from MIT in 1977 and before graduate school served as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Philippines. Among other things, he's worked on the impacts of nuclear war on climate and food for the past 40 years. Thank you, Alan. You want me to do my talk now? Or you, oh, Please, okay. yes. All right, sure. Please. Let me share my screen. And uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for having me. And I wanted to talk about the global famine after a nuclear war. Uh, this work was done by a bunch of old guys uh, in the past, but we also have a bunch of young people who, and, and, and women and men who are crop modelers and uh, climate modelers and oceanographers. We've written lots of journal articles, which you can get from my website, but I just want to summarize it. Now, here's our beautiful planet, but after a nuclear war, it might look like this, with a cloud of smoke covering the northern hemisphere, moving into the southern hemisphere, blocking out the sun. This would come from fires started by nuclear weapons targeted on cities and industrial areas. If there was enough smoke, temperatures would get below freezing, even in the summertime, and we call that nuclear winter. Obviously, it would have devastating effects on agriculture. The first paper that made this uh, clear was by Paul Crutzen and Ch John Burks, who pointed out that there would be fires after nuclear war. And 
Uh, so here's here's a, a graph of the total number of nuclear weapons deployed on the planet. And you see there was an arms race up to the 1980s, and the arms race ended. And uh, the Crutzen and Burke's paper was published in 1982. Then a group of American scientists and, and Russian scientists calculated how the climate would change. And they said it would be nuclear winter. I did a paper also the next year, and a group, an American group did, and then the arms race ended. Uh, it wasn't because the Soviet Union ended. That ended five years later. And by the way, there's still 10,000 nuclear weapons on the planet. Although the number has been going down, it, ha it stopped going down, and that's the problem. So I think what we did in the 1980s had something to do with the end of the arms race. Ronald Reagan, one of the two people who made the decision, was U.S. president. He said a great many reputable scientists are telling us such a war could end up in a victory for no victory for anyone, and it would cause uh, a nuclear winter. And Mikhail Gorbachev also said models made by Russian American scientists showed a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter. So if we look back to World War II, this is a map drawn by the U.S. Army of all the cities that were firebombed in Japan in the summer of 1945. That was the policy to just uh, kill civilians. And the 68th and 69th cities were Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the only difference was they only needed one bomb for those, not, not multiple incendiary bombs. In Hiroshima, a 15 kiloton bomb killed about 150,000 people. And this picture on the left is the mushroom cloud made when the bomb exploded, but the picture on the right is a pyrocumulonimbus. It's a thunderstorm generated from the heat from the fires, and which was started in Hiroshima, and this is three hours after the attack. This is not the mushroom cloud. And this smoke was pumped up into the upper atmosphere where it lasted for a long time. This is pictures drawn by one of the survivors. Another, And this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. Everything burned. Three days later, this bomb, the, the Fat Man uh, plutonium bomb, was dropped on Nagasaki. Here's the mushroom cloud. And Nagasaki also looked like that. So... It's not just nuclear weapons that can burn cities. In 1906, there was an earthquake in San Francisco. Jack London wrote about it, and he said uh, there, there was a vast conflagration. I watched the vast conflagration from out on the bay. It was dead calm, yet from every side wind was pouring upon the doomed city. The heated air rising made an enormous suck. Thus did the fire of itself build its own colossal chimney through the atmosphere. So this is a pyrocumulonimbus that pumps smoke up into the atmosphere, too. This is what San Francisco looked like afterwards. So there's more than 12,000 nuclear weapons on the planet. This is a, a calculated by the, the University of Nagasaki. And the U.S. and Russia have most of them, more than 90%, but there are seven other countries that have nuclear weapons too. And uh, so this is a satellite picture. So they could have a nuclear war too. This is a satellite picture of uh, this is India and Pakistan. And we started working almost 20 years ago, what would happen if they had a nuclear war? And uh, it turns out that they could produce a lot of smoke too, 5 million tons. And we calculated what the climate response would be. And here's a movie of where the smoke would go. It would be blown around the world and it would go up into the upper atmosphere. This is the troposphere where we live, and the, there's no rain in the stratosphere to wash it out, and it would last for years. And it would produce instant climate change. It wouldn't be nuclear winter, but temperatures would get below the Little Ice Age. We also then said what would happen if the U.S. and Russia had a nuclear war, and a lot more smoke, and it would, temperatures would get very cold in the summer. This is the first summer. We took a point in the Ukraine and looked at the temperature. This uh, this is freezing, zero degrees Celsius. And normally in the summer, it gets warm in the summer and cold in the winter. But if you put the smoke in, temperatures would get below freezing for a couple of years. Clearly, this is nuclear winter. And we've done more recent calculations. And we, we now know that Pakistan and India could have up to four or 500 nuclear weapons bigger weapons, bigger targets, and we calculated what would happen if they had a nuclear war today. 
And so we looked at these scenarios. India Pak and Pakistan could use different numbers of weapons, different size weapons. U.S. and Russia could still produce a nuclear winter. And this is a horrific number of direct fatalities from dropping these number of bombs, billions and millions of people. In World War II, about 50 million people died. So India and Pakistan could kill more people directly than in all World War II. But it's much worse than that. We then said, well, what would happen to the temperature? These are the India-Pakistan cases. Temperatures would get below you know, five degrees Celsius, uh, same as ice age temperatures for five years, U.S. and Russia would get even colder for five years until the smoke started to fall out. And we looked at what, how it would affect agriculture. It would get darker, it would be colder, and there'd be less rainfall. All of these things would affect agriculture. And we wrote a paper uh, two years ago now uh, on what would happen to food. And we calculated for each country in the world how much food they could grow. And we looked at what their diets were. And we used a crop model and we looked, we considered livestock and we looked at how the temperature would change and we looked at fish. And it turns out that for these India-Pakistan cases, 20 to 40 percent of the number of calories available would, would be uh, reduced. In the U.S. and Russia, 90 percent of the calories would be reduced averaged over the world for years. Alan? Yes. Yes? One, one, one more minute. Okay. And so we calculated how much, uh, how many people would be alive after two years if they couldn't grow because of the climate change. This is for an India-Pakistan case. Uh, the dark number colors are, are people, number of people that would starve, a large number at high latitudes. For an India-Russia case, most people uh, in most of the Northern Hemisphere would die. And so now I'm adding a column to this this chart. This is the number of people that would die uh, because of starvation. It's more than 10 times as number the number of the direct effects. Almost 20 times as many people would die. A war between India and Pakistan could kill 1 to 2 billion people. A U.S.-Russia war could kill most of the Earth's population. So uh, we looked at... at uh, analogs. I don't have time to show them to you. Uh, well, this is uh, after a big volcanic eruption. For three years following Tambora's explosion, to be alive almost anywhere in the world meant to be hungry. So the conclusions are that the current nuclear arsenal could produce nuclear winter, and nuclear winter could kill most of humanity. So uh, I'll, I'll end there. Hope we learn from this so our beautiful plant looks like this for a long time to come. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, you've given us a lot of information. You know, oftentimes we talk about uh, how do we get people to talk and deal with the dangers of nuclear war, and you certainly have given us a lot of information about those dangers, uh, and the dangers of nuclear weapons. And I'm reminded, having come from the uh, TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons Conference, that the, the need for getting the nuclear armed nations to sign on to that treaty. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. I, getting to questions, I was in error. There is no Q&A button at the bottom. So, yeah, I didn't see one. <laughs> right. So please raise your virtual hand and that is in the reactions button down at the bottom uh, so that I can see your hand. And please, again, make your question a real short question so Alan can answer it. Ruth. And uh, let's see, do I see any questions? Timon. I think there was someone before me, but um, my 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 question, Alan, is about the the um, targeting of military targets rather than cities, like you know the missile silos and submarine bases and so on. Have you have you looked at that and compared what the soot w results would be? Yes, uh, if you just targeted missile silos out in the uh, in the desert, th they would be ground burst. They would kick up a lot of dust, and they wouldn't produce a lot of smoke. So that would have much less climate uh, impacts. But there are many military targets in cities. There's this funny five-sided building in Washington. There's command and control. There's airports. And so 
when I talk to military people, they all include cities. Uh, many, there's like maybe 50, 50 targets in Moscow and probably as many in New York and Washington. And so you can't count on that just just military targets out where there's nothing to burn. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, Ellen, you said Ruth. I don't see her hand. But... I saw a hand and then it disappeared. That's okay. what Simon well, saw. Too. I just wanted to say stunning, stunning presentation, accessible to anyone. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Ruth. Let's go to Aaron. Um, yes, uh, thank you for that that very clear and and uh, and uh, troubling, distressing uh, presentation. Um, my question is uh, whether you have modeled smaller scale conflicts than uh, an all out uh, nuclear exchange between uh, two large nuclear powers. Yes, um, uh, I. I uh... I showed that graph, that table of and what what matters is how much smoke there is. And so when we looked at India and Pakistan 20 years ago, maybe 5 million tons of smoke. The U.S. and Russia could produce 150 million tons of smoke. But there's many other scenarios of how a nuclear war might be fought between India and China, the U.S. and China, North Korea, and so forth. And so it doesn't matter who the combatants are. What matters is how much smoke gets up there. People talk about limited nuclear war, but I don't know how to limit nuclear war once it starts. So the danger is it would be much larger scale. But it, the climate response depends on how much smoke goes in the atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff. Uh, quick question, Alan. Are those smoke uh, contaminated or like part of the uh, fallout? Uh, Salamat. Uh, the the uh, uh, I was in the Peace Corps in the Philippines, so <laughs> recognize your accent. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, we modeled uh, black carbon particles, but there would be a lot of other stuff too, including organics and and things coating it. But they might be uh, destroyed by ozone quickly. And so right now we're working on putting more complex characterization of the smoke to see what difference it makes. If the particles are larger, they would fall out faster too. But we're working on that. Oh, we have time for one more quick question, Peter. Alan, um, Alan was there first, I guess. Nuclear winter strikes me as a gross understatement. Can't we come up with a better term? It was coined way back when nobody believed it. And I think, in fact, it was proposed by the nuclear war planners or the folks who were on their side. Maybe not, but no. Okay. The, what, what happened was. Uh, Tune to uh, Turco et al. were going to give a talk about climatic effects of nuclear war. They worked for <clears> NASA, <throat> and NASA told them you can't use nuclear war in the title. We'll lose our funding. So they thought up nuclear winter. But what? But uh, and so what would you propose? I mean, there would be a lot of disruption of of infrastructure, of communication, and there are a lot of other side <clears throat> effects from nuclear war in addition to climate response. But what would you suggest? Well, I think I'm pretty good at branding I'm myself. <laughs> With, with that, uh, Peter, you can put your suggestions into chat. And Alan, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So much for your presentation. Uh, next, we go on to David Boris. Now, um, David is a longtime leader and organizer in the Chicago Peace Action, a friend and fellow advocate. He <laughs> could not be here today but he has sent us a video. So, uh, Cole, let's hear from David. Good afternoon. My name is David Boris, and I speak as a board member of Chicago Area Peace Action. I'm sorry I'm unable to join you in person today, but I want to thank you all so much for holding this important conference on a topic that, unfortunately, does not get the attention it deserves in the mainstream media. I've been asked to address the folly of buying and building new ICBMs, and I think this very title is a good place to begin. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines folly as, one, lack of good sense or normal prudence and forethought, and two, criminally or tragically foolish actions or conduct. And so I want to be clear that we are not simply looking to have an informed debate on the nuance of nuclear weapons policy on a path to complete disarmament, 
or on a protocol with time certain metrics to ultimately eliminate nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. Those are indeed critical conversations to have and to have in a robust fashion. But today, we're instead talking about the absolute foolhardiness and yes, criminal and tragic conduct involved in developing and deploying a new generation of the most destructive weapons on the face of the earth, intercontinental ballistic missiles, armed with 1.2 megaton nuclear warheads, each missile possessing approximately 80 times the destructive force of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Allow me to lay out my top three reasons for seeing the replacement of over 400 Minuteman III missiles with a new Sentinel missile, formerly known as the ground-based strategic deterrent, as an exercise in folly. One, the cost. Two, the incentives for and dangers of early or accidental launch. And three, the sacrifice of global leadership. For a small bit of background and an understanding of the cost, I bring us back to April 5th, 2009, when the newly inaugurated President of the United States, Barack Obama, spoke in Prague and declared, quote, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Tragically, only 12 short months later, stumbling blindly into a Faustian bargain with Congress to get the new START treaty approved, this same president authorized the Nuclear Modernization Program, a then estimated $1.7 trillion program to modernize and upgrade our entire nuclear capability with $264 billion alone set aside for the replacement of the 400 ICBMs that comprise the land-based leg of the US nuclear arsenal. In a nation that struggles to feed its children, 13 million children live in food and secure homes, provide necessities to families, one in six children in the US live in poverty, and where we suffer critical shortages of doctors and nurses, 340,000 and growing by the year, we can ill afford such a tremendous waste of resources and the deployment of weapons developed to according to the joint statement of the five nuclear armed states that are party to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, quote, fight a war that cannot be won and must never be fought. And while disclosures just this past month by the Pentagon itself on the staggering cost overruns for this ill-advised venture to begin with might stop the current program temporarily, you can rest assured that the concept Hello. of refurbishing this uniquely destabilizing yes, element yes. of our nuclear arsenal is not slated to go away, making our opposition ever more important. <laughs> and the destabilizing nature of this aspect of our nuclear arsenal, the land-based component of our nuclear triad, on which almost every military and foreign policy expert agree, is the least effective and most dangerous leg of what we call our nuclear deterrent. It is fixed in position, not mobile, and well known to all of our potential adversaries. As a matter of fact, our own Defense Department refers to these missile silos as the sponge, meaning they are meant in the unthinkable scenario of all out nuclear war to soak up hundreds of incoming nuclear weapons so they will be diverted from cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, or Chicago effectively sacrificing as a nuclear bait the 10.2 million residents of the five states that house the silos. But knowing that, our potential adversaries simply keep large, large enough arsenals to target the silos and the aforementioned cities, among other targets. Witness China's current nuclear modernization program of its own is an example where they mean to expand their current arsenal of about 300 warheads to over 1,500 by 2030. And most importantly, unlike the submarine and air legs of our nuclear arsenal, these weapons once launched cannot be recalled and have no self-destruct mechanism. Finally, most of these weapons are set on yeah. trigger alert, giving a US president about 20 minutes to decide whether to launch and effectively eliminate 
60 to 70 percent of all life on earth. It is hard to imagine a word other than folly to describe this arguably insane policy. Finally, global leadership. The American people like to think of this country as, at best, the indispensable nation, or at the very least, the nation that sets and adheres to standards around equal justice, fair play, and executing foreign policy with foresight. That was the aspirational emotion captured by Obama's powerful 2009 speech in Prague. Instead, the hypocrisy embodied just 12 short months later is simply staggering. Combined with our response to September 11, which virtually every reputable foreign policy expert and historian now recognize as one of the great missed opportunities in all of US history, the immensely flawed decision to invade Iraq, which has destabilized the Middle East for generations to come, and our belligerent, provocative, and short-sighted behavior toward China, the United States is clearly turning squandering global opportunities for leadership into its own unique art form. And the only proper description of such behavior is pure folly. Let's hope, and not simply hope, but take on the work and not shrink from this deep and abiding imperative to continue with all available means and the utmost of energy to stop this nuclear madness and call out the folly of building a new generation of the instruments of Armageddon. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, you know, this is something that I remember uh, Noam Chomsky coming back to time and time again. The ICBMs are dangerous, they are expensive, uh, and we need to organize to get rid of them, not spend money to make them bigger and better. Um, Cole, do you see Medea? Is she... uh, Medea, Medea sent a video. Oh, she did. There's a big Palestine protest today, and she's at that. Okay, wonderful. Well, I let me just say, I, Medea Benjamin, I, Medea Benjamin is the co-founder of Code Pink, Global Exchange, Peace in Ukraine Coalition, Unfreeze Afghanistan, ASEER, which is the Alliance for Cuba Engagement and Respect, and the Nobel Peace Prize for Cuban Doctors Campaign, and an author. She brings intelligence, passion, humor, and humanity in her advocacy against war and for peace. Uh, she is the woman I think of when you say a person speaks truth to power. That is Medea. So let's hear from Medea. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I'm so sorry I'm not there in person, but I wanted to speak about Ukraine and the potential for a nuclear war. We will soon be marking the second anniversary of the war in Ukraine. While the war in Gaza has eclipsed the Ukraine war in terms of public attention and even ferocity, especially in its impact on children and innocent civilians, the war in Ukraine continues unabated. Since the failure of Ukraine's much touted counteroffensive, it is commonly understood that the war is at a standstill, with Ukraine unable to dislodge Russia from controlling about 18% of Ukraine's pre-2014 territory. The US government continues to support Ukraine with a $60 billion package pending in Congress. While there has been some opposition to US funding of this war, particularly from the Freedom Caucus of the Republican Party, for the most part, both parties support the war. The White House, instead of pressing for negotiations, has consistently encouraged Ukraine not to negotiate. Some U.S. officials see this war as a way to weaken Russia without risking U.S. lives. But this cynical calculation has led to the deaths of many Ukrainian civilians and soldiers, 
as well as many conscripted Russian soldiers who do not want to fight and die in this senseless war. As long as the war continues, there is also the risk that it will turn into a wider regional war, as well as the risk of a nuclear war, especially since this is in part a proxy war between the United States and Russia, which together possess over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. The US 2018 Nuclear Posture Review said that the US would use nuclear weapons, quote, only in extreme circumstances to defend the vital interests of the United States and its allies, end quote, which were already deliberately vague conditions, but it explicitly included a nuclear response to, quote, significant non-nuclear attacks. It provided examples of what such an attack could include, but it also stated it was not limited to these. In effect, it removed any firm restriction at all on a U.S. nuclear first strike. On the Russian side, in June 2020, President Putin stated, quote, the Russian Federation reserves the right to use nuclear weapons in response to the use of nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction against it or its allies, and also in the case of aggression against the Rus Russian Federation with the use of conventional weapons when the very existence of the state is put under threat, end quote. So Russia's policy also left a lot to interpretation leaving it up to Russia's leaders to determine at what point an ever escalating war on Russia's borders was going so badly that it put the very existence of the state under threat. To make matters worse, the 11 to 1 imbalance between U.S. and Russian military spending has the effect of increasing Russia's reliance on its nuclear arsenal, particularly tactical nuclear weapons, since its conventional forces are more limited than those of the United States. Unlike strategic nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons are designed to be used in a battlefield in a war. Both the United States and the USSR developed these weapons in the 1950s. The use of a tactical nuclear weapon would not necessarily lead to a full-scale nuclear war, but it certainly could. And so it would entail huge existential risks. In a public speech on April 14, 2022, CIA Director William Burns warned that com about complacency over these dangers. He said, none of us can take lightly the threat posed by a potential resort to tactical nuclear weapons or low-yield nuclear weapons, end quote. Most Western predictions about whether Russia would use nuclear weapons are based on statements by Russian officials. But whether Russia is backed into a corner in which it would decide to use nuclear weapons also depends very much on Western policy. The USDIA's assessment that Russia sees the use of a tactical nuclear weapon as an option to bring its enemy to the table to sever peace on Russia's terms underlies the double danger of aggressive Western policies. On the one hand, by encouraging Ukraine to reject talks with Russia, the West put Russia in precisely the spot that its doctrine on tactical use of nuclear weapons is designed to address. If Western leaders were deliberately trying to goad Putin into using a tactical nuclear weapon, this would be the surest way to do it. On the other hand, this aggressive Western policy suggests that if Russia actually used a tactical nuclear weapon, the same Western leaders would surely double down on treating Russia as a pariah that nobody should ever negotiate with, which would only make further nuclear escalation more likely. Some Western politicians might even see Russia's breaking of the nuclear taboo as an opening the door for them to use nuclear weapons as well. The whole concept of tactical nuclear weapons that the United States, NATO, and Russia have all been toying with is a quest for a way around the nuclear taboo and the assumption that any use of nuclear weapons would escalate to mutually assured destruction and nuclear winter. But we are in uncharted territory. Both sides have obviously carried out simulations and developed strategies to permit a limited tactical use of nuclear weapons while trying to prevent it from escalating into full-scale nuclear war 
But the only thing that is certain and predictable about war is that it is inherently chaotic and unpredictable. Nobody can be sure that the first nuclear explosion in Ukraine would not lead to Armageddon. As nuclear weapons experts agree, the difficulty in predicting and preventing nuclear war is that while the probability might seem low in a given situation, a nuclear war would be the greatest catastrophe in human history and end life as we know it, and is therefore unacceptable under any circumstances. So the kinds of calculations that can be applied to other risks simply don't apply. And the only way to be truly safe is to eliminate nuclear weapons altogether. The United States has rejected numerous opportunities to cooperate with Russia on nuclear weapons over the years, dating back to the end of World War II, when President Truman rejected pleas to turn the bomb over to the United Nations under international supervision. President Reagan rejected President Gorbachev's request that he give up deployment of a Star Wars missile defense system in space as a condition for both countries to eliminate all their nuclear weapons. Under President Clinton, the United States failed to ratify the 1996 Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and has still not done so, while Russia ratified it in 2000. President Clinton refused President Putin's proposal to cut the country's massive nuclear arsenals to 1,500 weapons each if the United States agreed not to place missile sites in Romania. President George W. Bush walked out of the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty and made plans to build an anti-ballistic missile base in Poland. After at first canceling Bush's planned ABM base in Poland, Obama later built one in Romania and revived the plan for one in Poland. Obama vetoed Russian and Chinese proposals for a ban on weapons in space in the consensus-bound UN Conference on Disarmament and also blocked a proposal from Russia to negotiate a cyber war ban treaty. President Trump placed a second missile base in Poland and pulled the U.S. out of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. The single remaining pillar of nuclear arms control is the New START Treaty, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, which limits Russia and the United States to an equal number of deployed strategic warheads and weapons carrying them in force since 20, uh, 2011. It was about to expire just as President Bush entered office, but the two countries agreed to extend it. Uh, I'm sorry, it was about to expire just as President Biden entered office, but the two countries agreed to extend it until 2026. Meanwhile, both countries are busy modernizing their systems to make them more, more quote, usable. Despite riding into office on the promise to work towards a nuclear-free world, Obama left office having secured a two trillion, three decades long plan to build a new generation of nuclear armed missiles, bombers and submarines, along with new nuclear warheads. Russia has also been modernizing its nuclear forces, replacing Soviet era systems with new missile sites, new missiles, submarines, and aircraft while developing new types of delivery systems. If an end to the war in Ukraine is successfully negotiated before it ignites a nuclear confrontation, this cliffhanger with Russia must serve as a wake-up call to get back to the business of disarmament, including, including renewing lapse treaties. But in the long term, the only treaty that will truly keep us safe is the historic UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Thank you. Well, we thank you, Medea, for those words. Uh, and uh, if we are not sufficiently scared about the use of nuclear weapons in uh, the area of U Ukraine, we are going to hear next from Trita Parsi, who will uh, talk with us about the dangers from Israel-Gaza conflict. And this is something that at this point, so many people uh, of all ages are very involved in. Uh, Trita Parsi is the 2010 recipient 
of the $200,000 Gray Bear Award for Ideas Improving World Order and the Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute. He is an award-winning author with a focus on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. He was named by Washington Magazine as one of the 25 most influential voices on foreign policy in Washington, D.C. in 2021, 2022, 2023, and eminent public intellectual Noam Chomsky calls Trita Parsi one of the most distinguished scholars in Iran. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Trita. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you so much for having me. My apologies that I'm doing this out of my car, but like Medea, I am at the protest here in Washington, D.C., and I've stepped out uh, to speak to all, all of you. Um, let me first say that the immediate nuclear dimension to what is happening in Israel and Gaza is, is not in the sense that any country in the short term is going to use nuclear weapons in that war, but rather that the deterioration of the security situation, which is deteriorating fast, the war is spreading, is going to make it more likely that we will see the spread of nuclear weapons in the region, whether it's from the Iranians, whether it is from the Saudis or Turks or others. Um, uh, so that is and should be a very significant concern because you can imagine what the current situation would be like if there were more nuclear weapon states um, uh, and still no real diplomacy and communication between the various sides. What I want to focus my talk to uh, about today, however, is uh, the risk of escalation in the region and the manner in which the American public can be effective in pressuring uh, the Biden administration to pressure Israel, uh, as well as other parties, in order to be able to de-escalate the situation. I am extremely concerned, not just by what is taking place in the region. And we've seen now that uh, two days in a row, the Biden administration has chosen to escalate in order to de-escalate by attacking the Houthis in Yemen, a country that the United States, Saudi Arabia, and the UK already have been bombing for eight uh, plus years. Now we're going back into bombing them again. And the argument, of course, is that this is needed in order to restore deterrence, in order to be able to uh, stop the attacks by the Houthis against ships in the Red Sea, because obviously those ships apparently are more valuable um, than uh, lives being lost in Gaza right now. But here's the problem. In the US media, particularly in the print media, we've reviewed it, um, there's hardly been any mention that the demand of the Houthis has been a ceasefire in Gaza, that the demand of the Iraqi militias that have attacked US troops have been a ceasefire in Gaza, that the attacks by Hezbollah against Israel have also been coupled with a demand for a ceasefire. Instead, the narrative that has been uh, presented is one in which essentially the Houthis are doing this just because they're bad guys. Uh, they don't have a de demand. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday that uh, went on for, I think, almost 1,500 words with no mention of what their demand was until that was corrected for reasons that I can't go into right now. This has then left the American public with the impression, uh, particularly mindful of the fact how, how this has been presented, that when Biden chooses to use military force in Yemen, it is simply because he has no choice, because there is no demand from the Houthis. They're just doing it because they're the Houthis. And only through deterrence can um, uh, these attacks be stopped. It is not so that the media necessarily has to endorse the ceasefire option. Uh, or to even say that necessarily it would work. But what the media has done is to deprive, deprive the American public of even awareness that there is such an option. And that option could lead to an end to the fighting, not just the attacks in the Red Sea, but the attacks uh, from the Iraqi militias in Hezbollah. And of course, the release of the Israeli hostages in Gaza and the end to the death and destruction in Gaza itself. That knowledge has been deprived of the American public, leaving them with the impression that Biden has simply no uh, option but to do this. The wording that was used in the New York Times yesterday is, is his hands are tied. They are not. If anything, Biden has tanned his own, uh, tied his own hands by not even considering 
the uh, ceasefire option and by the media not even making it sure that the American public is aware of that option. In fact, when we take a look at what happened during the six days between November 24th and November 30th, when there was a ceasefire for those six days, attacks by Iraqi militias, according to the Pentagon itself, against U.S. troops, completely stopped. Attacks by the Houthis significantly reduced. We looked into it. We could only identify one case uh, that could clearly be attributed to the Houthis. Violence between Israel and uh, Hezbollah also reduced. So we have clear evidence that through a ceasefire, not only can we get the release of the hostages in Israel, uh, in, in um in Gaza, because the only time that there actually has been uh, the release of hostages, there has been through this uh, ceasefire. There's one uh, Israeli soldier that was released, um, but it's unclear what those circumstances uh, were outside of the ceasefire uh, and end to the fighting. But we can also, through that ceasefire, prevent this further escalation that very well now could lead not only to the U.S. becoming an active party in the war, which it now has become because of the bombing of Yemen, but also not end up getting attacked and starting to see American body bags coming home uh, and getting further drawn into what likely will become a regional war. My recommendation suggestion is that this angle, that all of this can be prevented through a ceasefire. It's not just for um, saving lives in Gaza, which of course is crucial, but it's also for saving American lives so that we don't end up getting dragged into uh, a wider war in the region. I, I, I believe that that is an argument and a framing that has the, uh, the potential of reaching an even larger audience of Americans who already uh, are skeptical um, about the fighting in Gaza, prefer a ceasefire, but it seems to primarily be because of very natural and understandable sympathy for what the Palestinians are going through. The intensity of that sentiment is likely going to be much stronger once it is coupled with a very, very strong sentiment amongst the American public, which is that we don't want the United States to get dragged into another war. So my hope is that this angle will be further uh, uh, elevated in, in all of the advocacy that is taking place because nothing will stop this war until Biden uses the immense leverage that the United States does have, but that he has chosen not to use. It's only when he chooses to use that or is pressured into using that, that this war will end and the escalation risk will end as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trita. And thank you for that thought of how we go about addressing or formulating uh, our request for a ceasefire. Uh, do you have time for some questions? Can we do that? Yes, I have about four minutes, if that's OK. OK, let's take uh, Robert. Can you unmute and put your question into question, quick question for Trita? Oh, I don't have it written, but I have it vocally. Yes. What about the way of achieving a ceasefire? Not Israel stopping, leaving Hamas in place, able to continue what it wants. How about appealing to Hamas and asking Hamas to surrender under certain conditions? And those conditions could be that they would, their lives would be spared, although if uh, some of them are tried mm -hmm. Uh, 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 by the uh, uh, world court, they could have life sentences, but no deaths. But in return for surrendering and disbanding and sur giving up the hostages, in return for that would be a promise that within three years, there would be a two-state solution geographic uh, Palestine areas in, in Israel, mostly the West Bank area. And oh uh, all all Jewish settlements on those uh, territories, the owners would be richly compensated financially, but would all leave. Okay, uh, Roger, I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to have to stop you there. So I think the, the Trita, point is, I think that Trita asking knows Hamas that, to surrender, not Robert, Israel. To Robert, stop. Robert, I'm going to stop you there. I think Trita knows what your question is about, and certainly it's something that uh, one hears. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, we do hear um, Blinken, for instance, saying that this war could end if Hamas just um, uh, surrendered. Um, 
your proposal is that it would be coupled with a promise uh, of them not getting imprisoned or prosecuted and that there would be a state three years from now. I think a challenge we have to really be honest about is that any American promise to the Palestinian side, not only now, but for some time, carries zero credibility. And that the prospects of the Hamas giving up in return for an American promise of a state three years down the road, however sincere that promise may be, it simply will not work. I, I would put the likelihood of that being far less than the likelihood of Biden using the leverage he has with Israel, because at the end of the day, we have shipped more than 10,000 tons of weapons since October 7th to Israel. And even if we were to make the argument that the administration is making, which is that U.S. really doesn't have much leverage with Israel, which I find, um, frankly, absurd. But even in that situation, that raises the question, then why are we sending weapons? Let's say that we don't have leverage. We can't stop it. Why are we prolonging it? Why are we fueling it? Um, the attacks against the Houthi ships at the end of the day, I think we have to recognize, is uh, a, a step in order to create greater capacity for the Israelis to continue to do what they're doing in Gaza. And I think an early impression that a lot of people had, myself included, was that Biden probably wasn't really crazy about this idea, but he was trying to find ways to convince the Israelis to um, not you know, kill 23,000 uh, people in Gaza. I think at this point, we have to be quite honest that Gaza, uh, that Biden signed up for the Israeli military objective of completely destroying Hamas. And whatever one may think about the, uh, the value of that goal, reality is that goal is simply unachievable. Uh, we don't have a lot of cases in which groups of that kind have been defeated militarily. Just look at our own history. 20 years of warfare in Afghanistan and the Taliban are back in power. And if you don't take it from me, take it from the previous Israeli Prime Minister, Ehud Olmert, who about two weeks ago in the Haaretz wrote an op-ed, and the first sentence was that the goal of completely defeating Hamas militarily is exactly nil. These are his words. Yet Biden signed up for that option, knowing quite well our own experience indicating that it won't work, Israeli experience indicating that it won't work. I think the much more likely path is to use the leverage to force a ceasefire, which also means, incidentally, that there are no more attacks by Hamas against Israel, and then begin real negotiations. Uh, but I do think that those negotiations towards a two-state solution, uh, the U.S. should be helpful. But any idea that the U.S. will be leading any future peace process in the region, I think is dead on arrival because the United States simply does not have any credibility left in the region. Thank you so much, Trita. We have uh, 30 seconds for another question and answer, uh, but um, I think we're going to have to wait on that uh, because I no longer see Trita. Did you plan uh, an announcement, Susan? Oh, oh, there he is. Yes. Okay. So let's go to Ira. Ira Helfand. Would you like to make an announcement, please? Yeah, I was, at, I was asked to announce two upcoming webinars, one tomorrow at 10 o'clock Eastern time that is being held by uh, ICANN, IPPNW, and Young Professionals in Foreign Policy on uh, our climate crisis and nuclear war. And the second, which will take place two weeks from today, uh, on Saturday the 27th, between 2 and 4 in the afternoon, uh, that is being sponsored by Pax Christi, on the need to build a world free of nuclear weapons uh, seen as an urgent imperative. Uh, and I think both of these can be very useful webinars for people to attend and just wanted to bring them to everyone's attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ira. And as we've heard from uh, four excellent panelists on the dangers of nuclear war uh, in this world right now, uh, we go to the costs uh, that those wars that military build up is uh, making for most countries in the world. So David, David Pack is the chair of PeaceWorks Kansas City. Thank you, David. Uh, hello to all uh, from uh, the Kansas City metro area. Uh, I am uh, a long-term member of the Board of PeaceWorks. I'm actually the treasurer. 
uh, and uh, uh, I was a long-term uh, member of the National Peace Action Board uh, ending back in about 2016. So we're happy to be here with you today. And uh, we are uh, in this session, as uh, uh, Susan said, going to be talking about uh, unsustainable costs of uh, nuclear weapons and military spending in general. And uh, I am uh, happy to first uh, introduce uh, uh, Lindsay uh, Koskarian. And uh, Lindsay is a uh, federal budget expert. Uh, she is the uh, program director of the National Priorities Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, and uh, I noted uh, looking at their website uh, that she has recently uh, put out a uh, publication uh, saying, sending Israel more aid now is a lose-lose proposition. So uh, she has also been involved, you know, in this issue uh, that we are, we've all seen uh, take such a role in recent months. So uh, I am uh, happy to, uh, to welcome Lindsay, uh, and she's going to be talking uh, uh, about uh, nuclear weapons budgets in particular. Uh, and so I uh, pass it on to you. Thanks so much, David. And thanks to um, Mass Peace Action for hosting this today and to everyone um, for being here. It's a truly impressive turnout. Um, and I know that there's a lot of interest and passion on this topic. So um, very, very glad to be here today. Um, I'll start us off with I, um, just talking a little bit about um, where we are in our budget process. Folks probably are, are aware of this. It's been in the news quite a bit recently. Um, but there are two, when it comes to nuclear weapons spending, there are sort of two legislative processes that or really matter. Um, one of them is the National Defense Authorization Act, um, which is a bill that passes every year um, and was just uh, signed into law by President Biden for fiscal year 2024, which we're already in, which started in September. Um, and so that outlines um, nuclear programs and nuclear spending. The other process is the re regular budget process, which as folks know, um, there's tremendous drama happening in Washington right now, um, multiple deadlines coming up and possible government shutdowns. Um, and uh, the House and Senate Republicans and Democrats have worked out top line spending, um, but they have not worked out the details as part of that bill. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth a little bit about what we know about current nuclear spending and future nuclear spending based on that. But that's that's where we are right now. Um, is one of these one of these processes is complete for fiscal year 2024, and one of them is very much still underway. I have some slides I'm going to share to just talk about the um, the spending situation. So can you see these? Yes. All right. So this is just the larger context of military spending in the U.S. And this goes back going back to 1976. Um, this is what our total military has spend, spending has looked like. And so for folks who are familiar with how this works, you know that there's a the Department of Defense, the Pentagon is the biggest part of this. There's um, also the Department of Energy, which is where most of the nuclear weapons programs are. Um, and so this includes both of those. Um, and so what you can see here is there's a big peak um, in the 1980s uh, under President Ronald Reagan. There's a big peak in the aughts and, and around 2010, um, which was the peak of our post 9-11 wars. Um, and there's another big peak right now. And that's uh, last bar there, the Biden request. Um, the blue part of that is what Congress has already approved and, and signed into law under the National Defense Authorization Act. The orange part of that is the war spending that Biden has requested um, and that Congress has not managed to agree to yet. Um, and that's war spending for Ukraine. Um, that would be military aid to Israel. That would be um, some board, that would be, um, this doesn't include the border funding part of that. This is just the, the military part. Um, so what you can see there though, is that that is the highest spending um, throughout this entire period. And it's very, very close 
Um, it's over $960 billion. It's very close to a trillion dollars um, just on the military and nuclear weapons. So that's kind of the, um, that's the background that we're operating in. Um, and then here's nuclear weapons spending. Um, and I actually had not looked at this recently and I was actually a bit shocked um, by just how far this has gone. And this is adjusted for inflation. I had to double check that myself because the way the trend goes up um, looks an awful lot like it might not be, but um, this is after inflation. This is the increase in nuclear weapons spending. And as you can see, um, since about um, since about 2012 or so, we have just been on a major increase in nuclear weapons spending. Um, so this is spending in, under the Department of Energy. This is the spending for the weapons themselves. Um, and it's the highest uh, that we have on record. Um, and of course, nuclear mm -hmm. weapons spending goes back further than this, a few decades farther than this. Uh, but it was it was never higher than this level. So we are at the highest level on record um, for nuclear weapons spending right now in 2024. Um, and as you can see, the trend is just going up and up. Um, so here, uh, that's one piece. Um, so this chart just shows nuclear weapons spending in the Department of Energy. That's the spending on the weapons themselves. But there's more than that. Um, there's also spending in the Department of Defense for weapons delivery systems. Those are the planes, the ships, um, the ground-based systems for um, intercontinental missiles. Um, and these are three of the biggest, um, these pictures show three of the biggest programs. So there's about $32 billion in spending um, in the Department of Energy for the weapons themselves. There's even more than that. It's about 37 billion total. Um, it's a little hard to say because some of the weapon systems are part nuclear and part not. Um, part of the deliver some of the delivery systems, you know, for example, planes that can either um, drop tr traditional missiles or can drop nuclear um, missiles. So, so some of these are are, um, but based on the budget request from the Department of Defense, we think that's about 37 billion dollars more. Um, in the Pentagon budget um, for these delivery systems, like the planes, the B-21, um, the submarines, like the Columbia-class submarines that are the new nuclear submarines, um, and uh, and the new intercontinental missiles, which are called the Sentinel. Um, and what I included here is pictures from each of the contractors, the main contractors, um, who are responsible for some of these systems, because I think it's really important to remember where this money actually goes. Um, so it goes to Northrop Grumman. It goes to General Dynamics. It's going to these contractors who are making a profit and who obviously have a very um, large interest in making sure that these systems continue. Um, I also think that the artwork, and it is artwork, it is, you know, these are artist renderings in many cases um, of these systems is is fascinating. You know, the beautiful sky behind, over on the right behind the intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, and I have difficulty using some of these images sometimes because of that, um, because it, it's so, it, it's just so incongruous to see that, that beautiful sky there behind the intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, so that's where the money is going. It's going for these, these delivery systems, it's going for the weapons themselves, and ultimately it's going to the contractors. And then um, just to end on a note, because we always look at sort of how we're using the federal budget to keep us safe. Um, and this is a big part of what's happening in the in the budget process right now, where um, the domestic budget, um, according to the spending agreement between Democrats and Republicans in the House and Senate, freezes domestic spending overall for the federal government. But it increases military spending, including spending on nuclear weapons. Um, so I just wanted to, us to see kind of, you know, how is our government investing to keep us safe? And as you can see, spending for nuclear weapons in the Department of Energy, this doesn't even include the planes, the submarines, um, the, the Pentagon delivery systems, but it far outstrips spending for these other agencies um, that are agencies that actually are responsible for public safety. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Aviation Administration. I'm sure folks have followed the incredible um, mis, um, 
misappropriation of um, of trust by the federal administration, aviation administration, that Boeing again, um, for the for the second time in a few years, Boeing again has commercial planes that are um, unfit to fly, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Of course, we all know now that pandemics are one of the big threats to to public safety um, and Food and Drug Administration. So, as you can see, each of these critical public safety agencies has a budget that is far smaller. Um, than the budget for nuclear weapons. And it's important to kind of have that context and to realize that in a very real way, Congress is trading off these spending priorities. Um, and as we speak, they have chosen to freeze domestic spending, including spending that would cover these other areas um, at the same time that they have chosen to increase spending on nuclear weapons and the military. So I'll stop there. And uh, I think, or actually one more um, to let people know about our website, nationalpriorities.org, where um, we have a calculator that you can use um, to, over the red circle, you can choose your state, you can choose your city or congressional district. Um, you can choose a program um, down below that. Uh, it's not always just military spending. You can choose nuclear weapons, for example, um, and then see what else the tax dollars could have paid for. So that's a very useful tool if you're writing a letter to the editor or if you're visiting your member of Congress um, or otherwise trying to explain to people what this actually means, um, this can be a really helpful uh, way, to, way to illustrate that in your own state or in your own congressional district. So I'll stop there and Oh, thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. Uh, and I see a couple of people uh, who have questions. Uh, Ronald, uh, would you like to go ahead? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yes, my name is Ron Betag. I'm from Houston. I'm a member of the Schiller Institute. I had a question um, regarding when the Soviet Union fell and um, it was a commitment, or at least an offered commitment, not to move the West e East in any manner. And that was then, as everybody here knows, violated. And there's been this commitment by this military industrial, but really financial uh, complex to continue colonialism. And my question is regarding one, the BRICS, the um, global South now in an open mm -hmm. revolt against the system for independence and development. And then linking that with the, the peace movement and the uh, ceasefire movement, you've got the power globally to actually reorganize this financial structure, actually put it through uh, retooling and then gear up these, as we just saw, there's a commitment to these wars. Uh, and it's it's from this financial interest to maintain a control. So things like the Oasis plan in the Middle East, where you develop the entire region by irrigating the whole place. So just wanted to throw out that as a question that you see the relationship between this financial blowout where like someone said, we're, you know, 34 trillion in debt, we've got a trillion a year plus a military budget as a, a waste. What's your uh, vision of that connection? And then this alliance I'm talking about where you link these various forces for development. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that earlier speakers would have had a lot to say to this also. Um, uh, you know, I think all of those, in terms of how they could come back to affect the U.S. budget and what I was just talking about, um, those are very long-term trends and forces. Um, right now, there's very little in the way of international solidarity that is directly, um, or, you know, those other, other forces you mentioned that is directly affecting um, this budget process and how Congress is considering these things. Um, there is there are no mechanisms essentially um, to enforce international law on the United States um, as we're seeing play out um, right now in the UN and as we've seen play out again and again before. Um, so you know, so I think these are long-term forces and I, I think ultimately, um, you know, the hope is that through some of those those processes and through some of the you know greater organization and and power in the global south is that eventually the U.S. will be in a position where um, there is less option for um, the a U.S. administration and for the U.S. Congress to ignore those things or to ignore things like the um, nuclear ban, 
um, that went into effect a couple of years ago, but to which the U.S. is not a signatory and obviously has no intention of, um, you know, the the military um, elite and president and Congress obviously have no intention of um, of allowing that to change our policy. So, um, so you know, I, I think I'm not sure whether it's an adequate answer to the question, but I am, you know, I think it's there are a lot of parts of that, but I think the the short answer is that those are all kind of long-term forces that I, that may play out in a certain way, but that for this year's budget process, for next year's budget process, very little of that is weighing on the minds of say congressional leaders who are cutting these deals. Just as a quick follow-up, you think that should be part of our role to actually make sure it happens? I think that's very helpful. Yeah. And, and I think part of, you know, I think what does weigh on the minds of congressional leaders as they're making these deals is U S public opinion that matters. Um, and so I, you know, that our job is to help move us of public opinion and attention in a way that there's more of an interest in, um, in cutting these, in these budgets. Um, and part of that can be solidarity with the global South. And I think we're, you know, for instance, we're seeing that very much right now with Palestine. So, um, so I think there is real potential for that. Um, but I think it's sort of a, you know, the mechanism is, the global South is looking for one thing. People in the U.S. become aware of that and organize around it. And then there's pressure on Congress and the United States and, um, and oh. the administration. All right. We, we have just a couple of more minutes. Uh, I know the next presenter is on tape and I've watched it and it's about 10 minutes. So uh, go ahead, Donald. Yes. Um, uh, I, I've been in contact with my member of Congress, Representative Adam Smith, who, who was former chair of the House Armed Services, he's no relation, but he, he tells me that he thinks the ground-based ICBMs are a waste of money. And he says, but what makes, and I think there are probably lots of members of Congress who believe this, but they, what Adam Smith told me is that it's it's hard for him to make the case for that because because he, sa he says people like me who, are, who say anti-American, you know, so we're, we're so anti-war and he, it seems anti-American. So a lot of the people in the establishment think that we're, you know, we're, we're extreme. So anyway, I wanted you to comment on, on, mm -hmm. you know, on the fact that I, on, on how to uh, get Congress to, to agree to um, that these facts that, and to expose the fact that there are members of Congress who agree with us on some aspects of this. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, and first of all, congratulations on having Adam Smith as your member of Congress. That was a, a great um, person to be able to communicate with um, in recent years. Of course, now that the House is under Republican control, Adam Smith isn't in charge of the committee anymore. But um, but and Adam Smith is is a really interesting case because he is a member of Congress who is is very reasonable about some of these things. But on the other hand, is also very supportive of large military budgets um and very supportive of u.s nuclear power and all of those things so um but but that makes him an interesting case um because he's not you know someone who's who's with us on everything um i, I think i actually think it kind of comes back to the same answer as, as the last question um i think often we think it's our job to persuade these members of congress and that is one way to to get them to do what we want but um the other way is we don't necessarily have to persuade them of the merits um, we have to persuade them of the merits of public opinion and the merits of um, what will happen if their constituents don't like what they're doing. Um, and so I think what we need to focus on often in our actual day to day work and in, in influencing members of Congress is saying, hey, your constituents don't want this um, rather than this missile system doesn't make sense. Because I, I think it's true that a lot of members of Congress do recognize, for example, that it doesn't make sense for the U.S. to have um, the ground-based strategic deterrent or sentinel um, intercontinental ballistic missiles anymore. But that's not enough, um, as you saw, to get them to actually vote with us and um, and act with us. So what it comes down to is br you know, bringing more constituents, having more constituents calling the office, all of that groundwork that um, that I know people on this call are also extremely familiar, <laughs> familiar with. All right. Uh I'm afraid we really need to move on. Uh, I, I would, uh, maybe we can come back to the questions that are out there uh, after the next presentation, I hope. Um, you know, our next presentation talking about unsustainable costs uh, is the human costs of the war economy uh, by Shaley Gupta Barnes. Uh, 
Shaley Gupta Barnes is the policy director for the Poor People's Campaign and the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice. Uh, she writes and speaks regularly on key issues around the interrelated crises of poverty, systemic racism, militarism, ecological devastation, and the false moral narrative of Christian nationalism. Uh, and uh, she's unable to be with us live, but Cole is going to share uh, a, a nice uh, presentation that she taped. Thank you, um, Massachusetts Peace Action, and everyone who's here today for, um, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I'm sorry I can't be here uh, in real time, but I wanted to share a few thoughts on um, on the human costs of the war economy, uh, a war economy that, as we all know, is gaining momentum and increasingly just going off the rails. Um, I think we're all familiar with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's caution about a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than programs of social uplift, how that nation uh, that does that again year after year is approaching spiritual death. And um, I've learned from Lindsay and the National Priorities Project um, that the U.S. has spent $21 trillion, $21 trillion on war, surveillance, policing, and prisons um, over the past 20 years. $21 trillion, not just on military defense, but on the militarization of our entire society, while life-saving programs to provide health care, food security, housing, and economic assistance have all been slashed. And so we must certainly be ever closer to that spiritual death that Reverend Dr. King warned us about more than 50 years ago. And I would say that today it's not even about spending more on militarism uh, than on programs of social uplift, but the rise in that spending that goes unchecked and unquestioned. There's just a blank check that's available at any time for the Pentagon and for war and for the military industrial complex. Um, there's, you know, seemingly endless political will for surveillance technology and detention centers and policing and prisons. And that is what is bringing us closer to the collapse of our shared moral values, um, because that spending ultimately reflects a politics and a way of organizing our society that prioritizes fear and violence and force over community and, and diplomacy and peace. And by peace, I mean a true peace where, where all of our needs are met, where we are made whole from the failures of our society, where, um, as, the, as the poet Langston Hughes wrote, um, we have a peace that brings reality to our dreams, that serves humankind and shapes the common good. Um, and we're very far from that right now. Right now we have a democratic administration that is actively supporting and funding a genocide of the Palestinian people. Um, this is in contradiction to world opinion. We're isolating ourselves from our allies. Um, not now. It's losing support among Americans here at home, in part because we can see in real time what's going on. And it's horrific. Uh, more than 20,000 civilians killed, most of them children and women, as well as journalists. And Have you been listening? Yeah. Many more. Mm -hmm. Good. Thousands of whom, mm. thousands more, sorry, uh, who are trapped under rubble. Um, yeah. Well, Israel has cut off access to electricity, to fuel, to water and food and medicine. And, and it's targeting hospitals and schools and refugee camps and civilian infrastructure that has led to the massive displacement of more than a million people. These, these costs of this war on Gaza and on Palestine, they don't just stay there. They don't just stay in, that re in Gaza. They infect the entire region. In fact, they're pushing us towards a conflict that could escalate even further. Um, but they also demean our, our common humanity. We can see um, every day in so many ways that this violence it goes on unabated and unchecked. And in a very tangible way, it affects our whole world. Uh, the, the emissions from Israel's bombardment um, just over two months are the equivalent of burning 150,000 tons of coal. These, these war emissions are, the, are greater than the annual emissions of many other countries. Um, over the over the cost of, uh, over the span of a year, 
And so while this, this you know, the Biden administration has, has continued to t throw down on its position for Israel, it has also cut access to, to health care programs, to Medicaid. It has reduced allocations for food stamps. It has cut other forms of assistance um, without raising minimum wages, without raising taxes on those who can afford them, um, revealing that, you know, once again, um, that we have, you know, more money for war, but not for the poor. And so it, it's in some ways no surprise that President Biden is losing support among voters. He's lost ground among black voters, among Hispanic voters, among young voters, among young progressive voters. You know, and meanwhile, on the other side of the aisle, we have a party that's been more or less taken over by a Christian nationalist movement, which I would say is another consequence of, of two decades of feeding the war economy. Um, and I describe it as a movement because it is. Uh, Christian nationalism is a political movement that is organized and funded around the idea that the U.S. is a Christian nation, that it is a white Christian nation, and that those in power should use their power to, to maintain and kind of broaden that, that, that vision. And this movement is wholly aligned with the rise of authoritarianism, with the demise of democracy and the use of force and power, um, including the power to pass policies that make life harder uh, for many, many millions of people to accomplish that vision and purpose. And currently, the Speaker of the House, the third most powerful position in the country is Mike Johnson, a Christian nationalist, someone who questions the result of the 2020 election, someone who believes in a national abortion ban, someone who believes that LGBTQ plus people are a greater threat, they are more dangerous than police armed with weapons of war. And so this political movement is organized, like I said, and funded it is organized into groups like the Moms of Liberty, a network of conservative women that has nearly 300 chapters in 45 states whose members are being you know, elected to school boards and they're changing our children's education. They are very, very active at a community level. It is organized into other everyday institutions like churches, but also militias right, who are ready to take this country back. Um, these are the costs. Alongside the human costs, these are the political costs of this war economy. And this is what happens when you prioritize force and violence and fear over meeting people's needs and building a sense of trust and faith in our institutions and in our society as a whole. And yet, um, I can't leave it like that. I won't leave it like that because as high as the stakes are right now, and they are high, as close as we are um, to coming to that spiritual death, this is not the end. It never is because it is always darkest before dawn. And we do have some signs of hope, some signs of light to move towards amidst, amidst this kind of escalating darkness. In particular, we have this call for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and this beautiful upsurge of activity, which is being led by those same young people who are losing faith in our elected officials. They are taking a stand for Palestine and for peace, some of them for the very first time. And this is a light in the overwhelming darkness. Uh, in December, I. Um, participated in action in D.C. with Reverend Liz Theo Harris and dozens of other people in the Capitol Rotunda. And it was a group of um, executive directors and leaders of progressive organizations who are, in some cases, very new to the peace movement. And, and this, too, was a sign of hope and light in the darkness, this expansion of, of this movement. The fact that labor unions have thrown down so hard for ceasefire, for a permanent ceasefire, including the UAW, the largest union in the nation, even though President Biden came out to support their strike in the fall, they are seeing past those politics and they are pushing back on this administration, calling for a ceasefire now. And this is a sign of hope and light in the dark. The fact that poor people who are losing their health care and doctors and nurses who are seeing the effects of that on, on various health crises that are unfolding right now, that they are coming together to call for a permanent ceasefire and joining this movement for peace. This is a sign of hope and light in the darkness. There is hope and light in this revival of the peace movement. And I have not forgotten that there is hope and light in the fact that those of us who have been around for a minute or for a few years or for many years, that we are still here, nurturing this revival, nurturing this new leadership, offering the lessons that we have learned from our own experiences and from movements past so we can build this one even stronger. Because as we know, there will be setbacks, there will be challenges. The forces that we are up against are not backing down. But then again, neither are we. 
We are here. We are here for peace and we are in it for the long haul. And this is a sign of hope and light in the darkness. So thank you for being here and thank you for this time. Thank you so much, Shaley, for your heartfelt words and, uh, you know, particularly uh, talking about the hope and the light uh, in spite of uh, the, uh, some of the the negative things that that we deal with, um, we uh, need to move on into uh, talking about uh, a, a slightly different area: uh, congressional battlegrounds for nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, go ahead and uh, introduce the first speaker. Uh, who's going to talk about supporting the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Uh, and uh, Larry Cohen is that speaker. And uh, Larry is the current chair of the National Our Revolution Group uh, that was started by uh, Bernie Sanders uh, back in uh, 2016. Uh, he was the co-chair of Sanders for president in 2016. Uh, he is a current member of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, and he is a former president of the Communication Workers of America. Um, so uh, we will go ahead and have uh, Larry speak. We're going to hold the questions uh, uh, until uh, a little later. Uh, Larry himself will introduce uh, Representative Rokana. Uh, so I pass it on to Larry. Okay, uh, great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. The audio okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, great program so far. And I think uh, all of us who have listened to this on the one hand are um, inspired because we have a path forward. And on the other hand, as, as Jonathan said at the beginning, uh, that inspiration is tempered by, you know, what we see in the world around us. So uh, this session that I'm uh, pleased to be doing with Representative Khanna, and as you heard, we'll I will introduce him in a, in a few minutes, um, is really about, well, what can we do in the Congress? And I, I would say it's also really about, you know, how do we win? So many of the many of us have been in this fight or similar ones for, you know, a lifetime for decades and decades. And so, you know, what is the path to win? And you heard um, several speakers talk about uh, the gap between President Obama's campaigning and what actually happened when he was president in terms of the bloating, further bloating of the military budget, um, the the huge blow up in spending while he was president uh, for the new round of nuclear weapons that we're very focused on here today. And, and really the gap between, you know, the path to election at any level and the path for change. And for all of us, that's really what politics should be about. It's about how do we win? It's not about how do we protest? When we protest, that should be part of winning. And I think that's where the frustration comes from uh, for so many of us. So in this section, we're gonna focus particularly on the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Representative Khanna is an active leader in that caucus. And why is that in a, a sign of encouragement? In other words, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which Bernie Sanders uh, started when he was in the Congress before he went to the Senate, uh, has grown now to over 100 members. It's approaching half of the Democratic caucus as a whole, and it has grown. And so the question is, is there a path where issues like this stop the new round of funding for nuclear weapons? stop the continued explosion of the military budget. 
ceasefire in Gaza, as we heard earlier today. Is there a path where the Congressional Progressive Caucus can be not just a collection of people who voluntarily join it, which it is, but also a place where those of us who are active in these issues have accountability, a place where the members of the caucus itself have accountability with each other. Now, that has increased in the last four years. Representative Jayapal, who chairs the caucus, when she got elected to her first term as chair in 20, uh, uh, 2020, her first term as chair, new rules were put in that there would be accountability on voting with the caucus on the floor. And I think for those of us on the outside, including me and the organization that I chair, Our Revolution, which is very active in that caucus, very active in electing people who will join that caucus, the question really is, how do we continue to tighten up, publicize that the people who voluntarily chair the caucus, how they vote, scoring them so that activist groups can confront members of that caucus, many of whom do not vote with the caucus. And also that the caucus sticks to its rules that if you don't vote with the caucus two thirds of the time, you won't be a member of the caucus because now what we have is the caucus is popular and to some extent people join it to prevent being primaried by quote progressives on the outside. So I think the good news is on the one hand, uh, we do have a vehicle that means more than it's ever meant, but we don't have the level of accountability we need in terms of those who join the caucus and lastly, I would say it's incumbent on us to engage in primaries. For the most part, primaries with incumbents, and we have lots of people on here from Massachusetts. Most of those eight representatives, they're all Democrats. They don't join the caucus. They certainly don't vote with the caucus. There are exceptions, McGovern, Ayanna Presley, obviously. But many of them are on the other side of these issues. I'm talking about the House members. The two Senate members are much better. But this is true all across the country, not just singling out Massachusetts. And just as Rokana, who I'm going to move to introduce, challenged an incumbent, lost the first time, 2014, won in 2016, and has won in landslides ever since, started by challenging a Democratic incumbent, 80% of House districts including every district in a state like Massachusetts, is overwhelmingly a, mass, a, a democratic district. So the military industrial complex that we heard a lot about today, that obviously is here to lobby members of Congress, they don't bother supporting Republicans in Massachusetts. They wade into the democratic primaries and make sure, along with other right-wing forces in this country, that they elect Democrats who will support the bloated military budget. So as I said for many years as president of the CWA on workers' rights, but also on other issues like health care reform, this is not hopeless, but it's hard. And I would argue, and I know Representative Kana will, that part of the answer to this is beyond protest and into political action and into electoral politics, and into building accountability of the people we elect, but also building this progressive caucus into a force that acts as a party within the party, a party for change. And one of the inspiring things about peace action, particularly Massachusetts peace action, has been building coalitions around issues like health care, around issues on the environment, so that it isn't just single issue politics, it's coalitional politics that stands for real change. Well, Representative Kana has been a leader of that change since he was elected in 2016. He's a member of Armed Services, and we heard Lindsay talk about 
Adam Smith, who was the chair, now the ranking member of Armed Services. Ro Khan is a member of Armed Services who's been willing time and time again to vote no in the committee and on the floor on the military budget. He's a member of the Committee on Armed Services who takes up the issues like the new round of nuclear weapons and the waste that it is. He takes up issues like the war in Yemen. He takes issue, up issues like ceasefire. He functions as the chair for Barbara Lee's campaign in the U.S. Senate in California, who's been the most consistent, outspoken peace advocate that we've had in Congress in our lifetimes. And the only one of the three Democrats, this is not an electoral meeting, obviously, that we're in, who supports ceasefire in Gaza. Representative Khanna was the chair of the subcommittee of the House Oversight Committee, the subcommittee on the environment. He brought in the CEOs of the oil companies specifically to talk about the cover-up that they were involved in, knowing for decades from their own scientists that fossil fuels were creating the climate crisis. They denied it, and they continued to work politically. We're talking about work doesn't mean their individual work. It means among the biggest contributors in both parties to those who are elected to the Congress. He brought them in to testify, put pressure on them, basically called them liars in that committee hearing. He led the fight to end subsidies, subsidies for fossil fuels. We're continuing to subsidize fossil fuels at the same time that our government now talks about the climate crisis and that we finally do subsidize renewable energy, but we're continuing to spend billions, tens of billions of dollars subsidizing fossil fuels. I could go on and on about Representative Conant. To those of us in our revolution, we consider him an amazing partner and advocate and leader, not just federally, but in the state of California, our biggest state, about all the things we love and all the things we want to see. And he's a member of Congress that it's not just about his next election. It's about how do we lead, how do we organize, and how do we win? Representative Khan, it's a pleasure to bring you to this uh, amazing national audience on peace issues. Well, thank you, Larry. Thank you uh, for your incredible leadership uh, for so many decades on issues of economic justice, labor justice, in uh, helping conceive of Bernie Sanders' campaign when he was uh, at 1% or 2% in 2016 and bringing those issues, uh, domestic and foreign, to the national conversation in the center of now the country's debate and for your leadership on climate uh, and uh, ending fossil fuel subsidies. It's been great to work with you closely on those issues, uh, as well as, of course, issues of war and peace and uh the topics we will discuss today. Let me start out by saying uh, what I think is pretty obvious. Uh, President Biden in the strikes in Yemen uh, violated the Constitution. Uh, he did not come to the Congress to seek authorization for strikes that were retaliatory. I was asked on CNN last night, uh, they played a clip of the president uh, saying that he thought that the members of Congress saying this were wrong. And I said, would you respect the president is wrong? Uh, war, war, the War Powers Resolution, which uh, allows a president to give 48 hours of notice to Congress, which the president did do, only applies if there's an imminent threat to an American military or uh, American possession. That would be if there was some uh, imminent missile coming towards our uh, Navy uh, in the Red Sea, or even we could argue American ships, even if they weren't military. But in this case, we've known since early December that the Houthis have been engaging in disruptive activity in the Red Sea. The president has had over a month to go to the United Nations and try to build an international coalition. 
So the idea that this was some sudden immediate attack that would trigger the war powers resolution just doesn't apply. And the question is not just procedural. The, the question is substantive, because I spoke to the Saudi ambassador yesterday. I, with Bernie Sanders, was one of the most critical people of the Saudi bombing campaign for seven years in Yemen. And we passed the first war powers resolution in the history of this country that led Trump to stop the refueling and Biden to, to end the refueling and started to bring the war in Yemen to a close. And the Saudis will tell you that seven years of bombing in Yemen did not do anything to weaken the Houthis. They realized it hurt their international reputation. They're now working hard on a truce in Yemen. So they're urging restraint for the administration and are cautioning against this kind of retaliation. That's the Saudis who were responsible for seven to eight years for the, the war, telling us we may want to be cautious before hitting the Houthis and reigniting a conflict in Yemen that finally had some truce. And if you ask them, and if you ask the UAE, and if you ask uh, the representatives in Egypt and other Gulf allies, what can we do to keep the Red Sea safe for American shipping and other uh, navigation, they will tell you the first thing we need is a resolution and a ceasefire in the conflict in Gaza. And we need diplomacy in the region. Predictably, after the strikes in Yemen, the price of oil has gone up. There are more ships that are being restricted in the Red Sea. So it simply has not achieved its objective. Now, members of Congress are reluctant to criticize the incumbent president, as am I, candidly, in a uh, election year where, in my view, we need the president to win. But this issue was uh, too far. Uh, you cannot have a president of either party uh, getting us involved in another Middle East conflict. And so I have spoken out very strongly, both for a ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire, for the moral reasons, the humanitarian reasons of the more than the bombing of kids and women in Gaza, the uh, potential of famine of the kind we saw in Yemen lurks now in Gaza. That's what every international organization is telling us. So we need a ceasefire on its own merits and a release of all the hostages and the work with the Qataris and others to get that done. But we also need uh, a ceasefire for the regional reasons of de-escalation so that we do not expand the theater of war, certainly into Yemen. And uh, I view over the next few weeks, this being an urgent uh, task for members of Congress, uh, particularly members of Congress and the, the Progressive Caucus, to try to get us to a point of ceasefire in Gaza and to prevent uh, a wider war in the Middle East. And to speak out very clearly about the illegality of these strikes because we don't want them to escalate. And if we don't take a position now, uh, the administration would have carte blanche to continue to escalate, especially if, God forbid, the Houthis retaliate and do so against American embassies or American personnel uh, overseas. So I, I think the, that that situation is very urgent, and I hope all of you will engage uh, with it, uh, with your members of Congress, with senators on social media. In terms of the federal budget, I uh, look when Obama left, it was about uh, for the defense was about six hundred some six hundred and sixty billion. I used to give speeches. I've never voted since twenty seventeen for a single defense budget because it has been, in my view, way too high and 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 giving too much uh, uh, of the profits to defense executives, which uh, uh, are charging ten thousand percent more for the same exact products that. Uh, NASA may be acquiring at commercial rate, but when the Pentagon is acquiring them, 10,000% uh, 10, more. There was a great uh, 60 Minutes report done on all this about six months ago, and many of you probably have already seen it, but it is, it's just waste uh, and overcharging that's, that, that's happening with the Pentagon budget. I used to give speeches saying, uh, this is going to head to a trillion dollars, and I thought I was saying it sarcastically, but we literally now are on a path to a trillion dollar defense budget. And uh, this should be a consistent position of Democrats to oppose uh, moving this defense budget to nearly a, a trillion dollars a year. 
56 to 57 percent of our discretionary spending, uh, money we could be using uh, for so many uh, urgent domestic needs, whether it's creating good jobs, whether it's building our manufacturing base, whether it's child care, whether it's free public college, whether it's health care. Uh, this has been uh, a huge drain of resources that aren't being used to help uh, many people in, in this country that uh, would be better, uh, could be better served. And then when you look at the nuclear issue that I know many of you have uh, worked hard on, and I've worked with Larry on this and uh, Representative Garamendi, uh, Bill Perry, uh, and uh, Norman Solomon, uh, the modernization, in my view, made no sense. The ICBMs are the sitting ducks uh, off the triad. Uh, we have the capability on uh, submarines and uh, air to have a deterrent uh, and and to have a deterrent uh, in, in terms of uh, of nuclear use. Uh, I opposed for that reason the the modernization of of the ICBMs. I'm now working on figuring out legislation how we at least don't have a launch on warning uh, situation where if someone launches a nuclear weapon against an ICBM, and that we're warned that the, the president would immediately launch back. Uh, we can for, candidly afford to lose an ICBM given the amount we have and still respond with the Navy uh, or some Marines or Air Force so we don't have a risk of an accidental nuclear war. And that risk has never been higher, as you know from the doomsday clock, uh, given the war in Ukraine, uh, given the instability uh, in the Middle East. We also need to, and this is something I wish the administration had focused on, but they haven't, to renew efforts to get uh, into the uh, ABM, the INF, uh, which was the Intermediate Nuc Nuclear uh, Treaty, which was actually one of, in my view, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev's great accomplishments, uh, and the Open Skies uh, Treaty and, and New START. Uh, skies, of course, that allows us to monitor each other, nuclear weapons. We haven't done any of that. And the excuse often given is, well, China is uh, now developing nuclear weapons. Well, we need China then to be part of the negotiation and Russia. And there has to be a effort to uh, have uh, concrete steps towards moving towards a nuclear disarmament, nuclear control that we've always had. Uh, since the 1980s, but have moved away from uh, with since George W. Bush got out of these uh, treaties. Uh, Obama uh, uh, tried, but, you know, we have obviously since then not really uh, done much on on trying to get uh, back on into these uh, these treaties or have them negotiated. And that is something that uh, I will be uh, advocating for, uh, along with other uh, progressive colleagues. Uh, and if you have thoughts on what the key agreements are, I'd, I'd welcome them. Uh, I'm at ro at rocana.com, and uh, you can send me them directly uh, at ro at, at, at rocana.com. Uh, so those are some of the you know overview of where we're at. And uh, as I touched, Delary, on the defense uh, and nuclear issues. It would uh, be open to, to hearing uh, from folks and having a a conversation. And if you do go, if you are on social media, any support for uh, my uh, calls that the president uh, uh, needs to come to Congress would be appreciated. Of course, expectedly, I've been uh, attacked by some as not a good Democrat for taking on the president on this. And I uh, wish him nothing but uh, success on his reelection. I'm part of his reelection committee. But that doesn't mean that we can be quiet uh, as we're inching into uh, another war. <clears throat> All right, Quite. we have a few. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I see uh, Donald. Yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, Representative, Representative Connor, thank you for generally being um, pro peace. But it, I, according to Defense News, in an article I put in the local chat, you you supported uh, arming Taiwan's arsenal, increasing the arsenal of weapons that U.S. <clears throat> Is providing Taiwan. Can you comment on on the on uh, the risk of war with China and how that can be stopped and whether you will work for that? Thank you. I did support uh, a multifaceted strategy on Taiwan that included uh, when I went to Taiwan uh, the need for 
uh, long range uh, weapons. I do think that that in combination uh, with a strong uh, presence in the Pacific provides deterrent. I am not for in any way a view that China, there should be a cold war and an actual hot war in Taiwan would uh, be catastrophic. Catastrophic, obviously, for the loss of life, uh, but also catastrophic catastrophic for the global economy. We would probably have a 30% drop in global GDP the next day. So the uh, position that I have taken is uh, one of uh, making sure we rebalance our economic relationship with China. I think we made a colossal mistake by allowing too much production to go to China for cheap labor, and that hollowed out the Midwest. And I think China made a mistake by relying as heavily on an export-oriented uh, low la- wage a- economy that they're now facing the consequences of because they haven't uh, built consumer welfare. In some sense, our countries were addicted to each other, our financial sector uh, and their export-oriented sector, and it hasn't worked out for either country. So we need a rebalancing fundamentally of the economy to be producing more things here. But then we need engagement with China. And I supported, I've said that uh, we should be going to China and the China committee uh, and trying to understand uh, the, the needs. And I have been one of the few people on that committee to explicitly affirm the one China policy, which is to say that the United States recognizes uh, that the future uh, of uh, Taiwan uh, is one that will be determined in peaceful uh, conversation between Taiwan and China, and that we aren't calling for Taiwanese independence. Uh, but what we are saying very clearly to Xi Jinping is, is that there cannot be uh, military uh, threats or coercion to Taiwan. Uh, and one of the reasons I've supported Ukraine is I do think that that sends uh, a message also to Xi Jinping not to try to have an invasion uh, in Taiwan. All right, uh, Timon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ro, for your leadership on so many of these issues. Um, I just wanted to ask about the nuclear ban treaty, uh, because you are one of the few members of Congress uh, who signed on to the, the pledge in support of the ban treaty several years ago. I don't know if you remember, <laughs> but... No, um, I support it. I don't remember signing on to the pledge, but I, of course, support <laughs> the nuclear ban treaty. Yeah. Well, can you say more about how we can build support for that in Congress? Because um, it's one thing to promote all the, the, the existing treaties and try to reduce the dangers and so on. But unless we get rid of nuclear weapons globally, we are never going to be rid of this threat. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I support the, the goal of uh, ultimately moving towards nuclear disarmament. I saw someone put in the chat HR, HR 77. I wasn't aware of that one. I'll have my staff take a look at that. Uh, the language I, that just hasn't come across. Uh, uh, so I'm happy to take a look at that if that's saying basically my support for the uh, a nuclear ban treaty, then I would sign on to that because I have already supported the nuclear ban, uh, ban treaty. Uh, but the, 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 the point is that I think that that is a uh, a leap for a lot of members of Congress beyond the progressive core to support uh, a nuclear ban. Now, we should keep working on it, but we may be able to uh, get more and more support uh, for the incremental steps, which is at least let's not get out of uh, open skies and ABM and INF and try to renew get being on the in dialogue and having certain arms control agreements. I mean, we moved in the opposite direction uh, from where the uh, the movement was in the 60s and 70s. So I I support it. I think we should encourage members of Congress to come out for it. Uh, but there are intermediate or short steps that are easier that I think we could get also moderate Democrats on, such as the launch on first on warning for ICBMs that, in my view, pose probably the biggest risk of an accidental nuclear war. Thank you. Hope it's not one or the other, but you can do both. All right. Uh, we We're are happy to work on both. Yeah. Um, Glenn, can you go ahead a quick? We were at the end of our time. Yes, I will be quick. Representative Kana, thank you for I know it is. I appreciate your candidness on how difficult it is to criticize the president of your own party, and I respect you for that. Thank you. You're on the president's reelection committee. Uh, my friend Heidi has lost over 30 family members in Gaza, and she's from the swing state of Pennsylvania. 
this entire election could come down to 40,000 votes in swing states, and I would want the world to burn too if my child was killed by American weapons. Do the Democrats on the president's election re-election committee understand that? That's difficult to vote for the president of the United States when your family was killed by American weapons when he was in the White House. And that some of these voters that we need are so stricken with grief and pain that they would want the world to burn and stay home instead of voting for Democrats. And that maybe if we get a ceasefire, we could get 5,000 votes in Pennsylvania that we otherwise would not have gotten. Thank you. Well, I, uh, first of all, sorry for uh, your loss. I've had many uh, constituents in my district in the Bay Area who have had family in Gaza. One of the uh, imams had eight extended family members killed, uh, five of them children. Uh, we had put out a statement about that. I've called families. So I understand the incredible loss uh, and pain uh, and anger. 40% uh, of those killed have been children. Uh, and we've all seen the horrific images. Uh, so putting aside the politics, I believe this is a moral issue. Uh, 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 it'll be a moral stain on, on our country to continue to support uh, the, the, the bombing the way it has been going on. And I initially supported uh, Israel's right to self-defense and get the Hamas perpetrators, but I thought that the way they should have done it was like in Munich, uh, where they went after all of the, athlete, the people who were responsible for the uh, killing of the athletes, and they uh, brought them to justice. But uh, in terms of the bombing, widespread bombing of uh, civilians uh, and uh, women and children, that has just uh, uh, really uh, been a shock to the uh, to conscience. In fact, before I came out for my ceasefire, my mom was on the phone with me saying, you you, you have to come out for this. Uh, you know, you ran against the Iraq war that in, in 2003. This has been you were against Yemen. This is this is really uh, important. And uh you know, your mother is still your most important constituent. You can't uh, can't be uh, against something which she, she rarely, rarely chimes in, in in politics, other than commenting on when my tie or appearance is off on, on television. So I, I think that the moral case is the most important. But the political case, I, I also think that the president has to realize that the Democratic coalition has changed. Uh, and that, yes, we have to, there are in Pennsylvania, uh, people who want to make, who are, clearly want a relationship with Israel, and that explains some of Fetterman's politics on it and, and Shapiro's politics of it. But there are also a lot of uh, young voters. Uh, if you look at Fetterman's favorability numbers where voters under 45 or over 45, it's shocking. He's basically got 80 percent approval over 45 and, uh, you know, way underwater under 45. And so the Democratic coalition is a very difficult coalition right now because you actually have electorally forces on both sides. Uh, but I think that uh, there is a way to convey that I I Israel is a, uh, is an ally, that there, that, that there is a need for a, uh, a Jewish democratic state and still uh, call for a ceasefire, still call uh, for the end of the current hostilities and the release of hostages and call for the recognition of a Palestinian state and be much more active in getting there. The United States basically was hoping that the problem would go away. And I think that was naive uh, and any future democratic president will have to engage. But I would just end by saying that uh, every day the bombing is going on uh, is not a good day uh, for the president. And uh, I have made that pretty abundantly clear to people who would listen to me at the White House saying, look, I don't know your whole coalition, but I do know progressives and I do know voters under 45. And you're very naive if you're thinking this is just a Michigan issue or Arab American issue or a Muslim American issue. This is a much broader issue of voters that you're losing. Uh, and we have to focus on uh, how we're going to win them back. Uh, it's about five minutes after the hour. I, I want to thank Larry and Congressman Khanna for their uh, participation. Uh, we probably need to move on unless, uh, I don't know, Cole, you want to, we should move on, right, Cole? Uh, yes, we're under orders to stay on schedule, so let's do our best. All right, and I'm Thank sorry. You. Thank you, Larry. Got, Thank you, everyone. We, we've got about four questioners out there, and I'm sorry we just don't have time for it. So we're going to move on to the breakouts, and uh, 
uh, coal will be, uh, you know, making that work. Yeah, thank you, everyone. So we have a choice of 16 breakouts. We're going to go for about an hour. Um, um, so we, in our final segment of our conference, we're going to talk about major grassroots campaigns. We're going to touch on four campaigns quickly. Uh, one is the Poor People's Campaign, 40 Weeks of Moral and Political Action. The second is Back from the Brink. The third is Fund Health Care Not Warfare. And the fourth is Ceasefire Now. So without further ado, we're going to go to Savina Martin. Uh, she is founder and tri-chair of Massachusetts Poor People's Campaign, active with National Union of the Homeless, and a fellow with the Cairo Center. Uh, Savina, if you're here, I'm going to put you on. Yeah, there you are. Thank you. Savina Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. I just want to say quickly uh, to our MAP partners, partners, and of course, on behalf of the Massachusetts Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Thank you and forward together and not one step back. And let me also just lift for a moment the hope and the light that I hear today, all of us, and particularly the coordinators of the Massachusetts Poor People's Campaign that keep us moving forward together. Thank you all for being here as well. In memory of Dr. Martin Luther King, I remember hearing one of Reverend Barber's video messages where he said, when prophets are killed or assassinated, our job is to pick up the baton and continue the work. Oh, sadly, he added, many will go to King's events today or tomorrow and claim the honor of the prophet. Right. Thank you, Cynthia. I think I'm supposed to be showing your slides, Sabina. Tell me if I've got the right ones. That's fine. That's fine. You could just hold off for a second and then move into another one. And I'll let you know. I'll let you know. And uh, so he added, uh, when I say he, Reverend Barber added that many will go to King's events, right? Between today and tomorrow and honor the prophet. Elected officials on both sides of the aisle will go while even today they are standing diametrically opposed to the things that he fought for. Addressing, as you see on the slide, systemic poverty, addressing racism, addressing uh, and ensuring voter protection, a just immigration policy, a just treatment of indigenous people, health care for all, you, you can turn the slides, and dealing with the war economy and militarism. So the hope in the light of Massachusetts, of the Massachusetts Poor People's Campaign leadership witnessed and will continue our fight around the ongoing social and economic costs of endless wars. Some of the photographs you see uh, when we were at our Congress this summer, we embarked on a four-day trip to Washington, D.C. to meet up with other leaders across the country, to meet with our U.S. congressional leaders. So we're fighting against the cost of endless wars, and we agree today in this conference on the path or the political paths away from the war economy and toward peace and a healthy, filled life away from war. You can turn the slides. They're just pictor pictorial slides of our journey. Today, we are here to announce the nationally coordinated, simultaneous 40 weeks of action led by 40 state campaigns and held in 20 or and held in every state house across the US. Last summer, the national campaign leaders again met in Washington and we mapped out a plan and met with every U.S. congressional leader, as you see in the photos. We were at the Rayburn Center. We were, we were knocking on doors and, and meeting with folks in their offices. Um, and um, we had with us our parents, our children, 
who we know are not in the way, they are the way, as we say in the campaign. There were faith leaders, moral witnesses, and more who joined us from across the country in a struggle to advocate against the unjust policies and practices impacting us to a death dealing policy murder. And that's where our fight is. And it doesn't have to be this way. Even before the pandemic hit 140 million Americans were living in poverty or just one emergency away from economic ruin from the social and economic cost of endless wars on our communities and around the world. And while millions of people remain without work, living wages, housing, clean water, food or health care, corporations and their and the wealthy are doing exceedingly well. Between 2020 and 2022, billionaire wealth grew by 1.5 trillion, more than 2 billion a day, according to our research that is empirically based. This is why across the nation, we are kicking off this 40 weeks of action and asking, will you stand with us? from February to early March, to June and to the polls. Will you speak and fight with us from across this nation, from Alabama to Mississippi, from West Virginia and the Appalachian to Alabama, to Maine, to Illinois, to Michigan and to Massachusetts. We are mobilizing at every state house, a poor and low wage worker assembly we are mobilizing thousands across the nation and at least thousand in, ev in every state. Uh, Low income you got one minute. And, clergy. and right now I'll turn it over to Cynthia, if she is here, who will talk about how to get involved. Thank I you. Am, yeah, thank you, Reverend Savina. So if you wouldn't mind advancing the slides there, we are gearing up, as uh, Reverend Savina said, for a mass mobilization here in Massachusetts. We put in the chat the link to the national campaign. So if you're in a different state, you can find your way there. Um, but we would love to see you join us on March uh, 2nd at the State House. I think if you want to keep clicking through slides, you're going to keep going um, uh, on. Let me just tell you what slide number it is. Uh, yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going, all the way to slide 16, where you will see that we here in Massachusetts will be gathering at 1030 in the morning at, at the Old State House, the site of the Boston Massacre. And we will be marching over to the Common for a rally. And we are asking all of our partners to uh, reach out and uh, bring people along. If, you know, movement math, if all of us on this call brought 20 people to that event, we would fill the common easily enough. And then in the chat, you're going to see a link to where you can sign up to join and get more information about the Mass Poor People's Campaign. And uh, I'll put one more link, which is just a link to our policy agenda. So you can see all of the many and varied things that we are demanding and standing up for and building a fusion movement across all kinds of lines of division to get it done. So looking forward to getting it done together with you all. Thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you, Savina and Cynthia. And I know you all have a lot more material and we can distribute that by email to everybody who's here so they don't miss the rest of your presentation. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Ira Helfan from Back from the Brink. Uh, let me just find Ira and put him on the screen. <clears throat> okay, can you see Ira? Let me just take that slide down. Okay, there you go. Thanks, thanks, Colin. Thanks, everyone. Um, you know, we've heard a number. Is someone of... speaking? It, yes, we might need Ira to speak now. Cynthia is muted. That says. Uh, it's Iris' turn to speak. Yeah. We've we've heard a number of really disturbing presentations today about the enormity of the threat. Hello. Oh goodness! Well, <clears throat> let's let Iris speak. Uh, other people may need to be muted. Okay. Can people hear me now? Yes. Cole? Okay. Sorry. I was saying we've heard a number of really disturbing presentations today about the enormity of the danger that we're facing from uh, the possibility of nuclear war. And one of the most disturbing aspects of the situation is the, the disconnect between the tremendous danger we face and the relative lack of attention to this issue. 
Um, many people have commented on that. This is just Elaine not is muted. people's minds, and it's not being addressed as a result of that. What we have done with Back from the Brink is to try to create a campaign that both focuses on what the solution to nuclear the nuclear threat is, and to also provide a vehicle through which people can express their determination to secure that, that solution and to become active. We were inspired by the adoption of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Elaine Weapons. Elaine is muted. Is it possible to mute? I mute can't you? understand where that noise has come from. I'll be honest to you. Okay, Robert sorry. Robert Reed. Perhaps we could mute Robert. Um, I had muted everybody in the chat in the in in here except for you. But okay, um, we were inspired by the adoption in 2017 of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons uh, and saw in this as an opportunity yeah. to really try to mobilize people here in the United States where the treaty activity had not been particularly strong. And we came up with a particular formulation that we did um, because we yeah. thought this was the way that we could reach the American public and that we could have some traction in the American political community. And I think events have borne out the wisdom of those decisions. Um, the Back from the Brink platform has now been endorsed by 70 cities across the country, including some of the largest, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, DC, Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Des Moines, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Tucson, Salt Lake City, um, Honolulu, Portland. It is our resolution in Congress, HRES 77, now has a total of 43 sponsors, including the original sponsor, Congressman Jim McGovern and 42 co-sponsors. And we're hoping, based on his comments today, that Representative Kahana will become the next co-sponsor. Um, and we've gotten over 450 organizations across the country to endorse this uh, campaign and the plat policy platform that, that, that it embodies. We've built a network around the country of, at this point, 16 hubs, local nodes of activity, uh, because our strategy is not just to reach out to Congress, but to do it by building active groups within districts around the country who will be, from a grassroots perspective, pushing their members of Congress, pushing their other elected officials to take the right action. And I think that what we have done so far is to create, actually, the vehicle that could bring about change in U.S. nuclear policy. It still has a long ways to go, but it's modeled on the freeze, and it very much resembles the freeze in the early days of the freeze movement. And what we need to do now is to grow this movement, to make it bigger, more vocal, more visible. And I would urge all of you who are not already active in the campaign to visit the campaign website, which uh, I will put in the chat. It's www.preventnuclearwar.org. And to contact, uh, reach out through the website so that we can um, match you up with the local hub in your area so that you can become active in this campaign. We need to have a specific focus for our work. All of us on this conference are concerned about the nuclear threat, but we need to have a focus of our, of our concern so that we can actually bring about the change that's needed. And again, I think this campaign is the way to do it and would urge you all to be involved. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ira. Uh, next up, we have Jonathan King, who's going to talk about Fund Healthcare, Not Warfare. Jonathan is Professor of Biology Emeritus at MIT. He's co-chair of Massachusetts Peace Action, and he's chair of the Fund Healthcare, Not Warfare campaign of Massachusetts Peace Action. Um, Paul, could you put up that? First slide. <clears throat> uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for hanging in here so long. Um, you know, it has not been easy to understand how in one of the richest and scientifically most advanced nations, the country was totally unprepared to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, part of the answer lies in the absence of a coherent national health system. We spend hundreds of billions of dollars on Medicare, Medicaid, private health insurance, and other support for the hospital system. But sadly, this entire system is focused only on people once they're already ill, and it's divorced from the effort to investigate the agents that cause disease. 
Um, the next slide. <clears throat> so none of the the trust funds, the mandatory programs, Medicare, Medicaid, or private health insurance or hospital budgets fund biomedical research that's required for disease prevention or public health or vaccines. Prevention of disease depends on programs in the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, Center for Disease Control, and a few other agencies. These are funded annually in the congressional discretionary budget. Um, uh, and the federal funding needed for these programs has been drained by the Pentagon uh, budget. Uh, it's important to remember that Social Security and Medicare are trust funds. We pay into them during our lifetime and uh, and then hope to get it back. They're not financed by income taxes, and they can't easily be reallocated by the Congress. Next slide. So the critical expenditures are the discretionary budget, which the Congress votes every year. Lindsay described uh, the recent NDAA. So fiscal year 223, uh, basically more than 60% of the tax dollars that you sent to the government went to the war machine. This is a little different than the official report because the government says that the VA administration uh, is a civilian expense. It's a, a, a absurd. The cost of prior wars is a military expense. So this green pie includes $143 billion uh, VA uh, uh, appropriation, which is normally put on the civilian side. The National Institutes of Health, responsible for all research that's going to save us from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, arthritis, heart disease, stroke, it's so small that it's not even a separate category here. It's under this uh, health and under science. Now it's about 5% uh, of total National Science Foundation, 1%. CDC about 5%, again, compared to 60% of uh, the military uh, budget. Now, um, some of this goes to pay salaries for soldiers, sailors, and airmen and housing, but more than half of it goes to corporations, to weapons contracts from large corporations, about 20. And half of that is about six major corporations, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, et cetera, who are making the nuclear weapons delivery uh, systems. These are cost plus contracts. They can't be contracted to the Chinese or Mexicans or any other nation. They're screened for public view by national security claims. Americans don't know, for example, that the manufacture of nuclear weapons is a business, a very profitable business, since the government buys all of them that are um, that are manufactured. Now, this budget. <laughs> um, on that left side, many of those programs should be twice as big, but they've been they've been capped or cut in order to afford uh, the military budget. In the same vote where the Congress appro appropriated some eight hundred eighty six billion dollars for weapons, they couldn't find five billions for vaccines for coronavirus for those who can't afford the vaccine. Next slide. Uh, now, unfortunately. Despite all we hear about income taxes, no agency of the government reports back to Americans about how their tax dollars are spent. And very few Americans know that more than half of the tax dollars they spent to the government are spent on weapons wars and war preparation. That pie chart, when I go around and talk on university campuses, that pie chart people are fixated on, and they say, I don't believe it. I'm a professor of political science. I would know if more than 50% of my tax dollars went to the uh, war. No, they don't know that. They're not told that. Uh, Representative Carol Doherty here in Massachusetts has a bill in the state legislature, the Budget Transparency and Taxpayers' Right to Know Act, which would have the state government report to taxpayers on how their money is spent and how the Congress spent their money. We'd love to see that. We haven't gotten it out of committee here, but we'd love to see that introduce it to other states. Next slide. Now, I'm going to focus in the last couple of minutes 
on higher education and biomedical research because that's where all the prevention is the development of vaccines, development of therapies. Next slide. And you got one, um, minute, Jonathan. Uh, so this was back in 2017. Um, Massachusetts uh, got about $2.7 billion from the NIH. That's what pays the salaries of the graduate students, the technicians, the postdoctoral fellows that are doing the work. It keeps the labs running, pays for the plumbers and the and the electricians and the carpenters and the lab supply. And it's the foundation of the biotech and pharmaceutical industry. It's so important. It's because of that investment that Moderna was able to so quickly come up with the vaccines. It was wonderful, but it represented years of prior investment. Now this budget, a million Americans died from COVID-19. This budget this year should be three or five times that. No, it's not. It's just increased by inflation in order to send, you know, $60 billion of weapons to the, to the Ukraine. Next slide. Now, this research is what's what we need for all the afflictions, not just for coronavirus, for heart disease, stroke, diabetes, etc. And the situation looks even worse. Um, the government knew, scientists knew, from the SARS epidemic in Hong Kong and the MERS epidemic in the Middle East, that the kind of pandemic virus was coming. Instead of ramping up those programs, they cut it, again, to find the military budget. It was a conscious political decision that created the situation that we were caught off guard by the coronavirus. Situation is not any better. These extraordinary Pentagon budget increases, cuts in the NIH, the Trump tax cuts. Um, now, right now, the pandemic seems to be under control, but lo and behold, it turns out that if you look across the nation, we have the worst maternal and child health um, record of any industrialized nation. Next slide. Um, oh, and I neglected to remind you that the Congress is going ahead with this insane proposal to spend $2 trillion upgrading all three arms of the nuclear arsenal. David Bohr has talked about how crazy the ICBM was. Um, not only ICBMs, next slide, you know, they're going to buy more nuclear submarines. We already got enough to blow the earth as, through the smithereens a thousand times over. Next slide. So that bar on the right, those are different countries. The U.S. has the highest rate of infant and maternal deaths in the United States. In New York City, black mothers die at nine times the rate of white mothers. In Boston, it's 46%. It's, it's a, a, a true public health crisis. And our fund health care, not warfare campaign, uh, it's what, what we're going to focus on in our effort to reach out so we are focused on reaching out to the community who deals with this directly, nurses, public health uh, officials. We've been very successful in getting working relationships with the Mass Nurses Association, Mass Public Health Association, National Nurses United, American Public Health Association, on the basis of we'll unite with you to increase funding for health, and we want your support to cut the Pentagon budget so, so it, it can be... Um, financed. Um, let me close with the fact that here in Massachusetts, we have a very t uh, dedicated uh, group, Catherine DeLore and Bonnie Gorman uh, and Beth Summers, uh, who have been working on uh, state legislation uh, for uh, improving uh, maternal and child health care campaign. But we know we can't get it just with state funding. We need national funding. Luckily, our own Ayanna Presley uh, has uh, put in legislation called the Mommies uh, Bill. It's um, uh, maximizing outcomes for moms through Medicaid improvement and enhancement of service, the Mommies Act with Cory Booker in, um, in New Jersey. We now have uh, committees, fund health care and warfare committees in, in, uh, in New York, uh, in Chicago, in, in Minneapolis, in California. And we'll be calling, uh, contacting nurses and public health groups across the country and ask around supporting uh, 
that improvement in maternal and child health care and, and supporting the cuts in the Pentagon budget, nuclear weapons budget that would need to, to, to finance it. So I'm already over time. Thank you very, very much. I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, our last speaker was to have been Marcy Winograd. She dipped in the conference earlier, but she's not here now. So I guess she can't make her presentation. Her topic was to be on ceasefire now, and I'll just make a couple of quick remarks. It should be evident to everyone here that the upsurge in the popular movement in response to the genocide in Gaza is the largest upsurge of the US peace movement in at least 20 years. There's a massive demonstration in Washington, D.C. today, as well as around the world. And this is the second very large demonstration in Washington. We've had demonstrations in Massachusetts in nearly every small town, every congressional district. Uh, there are multiple groups springing out of the ground, taking action. So uh, the demand is ceasefire. The demand is no U.S. military aid to Israel. And I think it's important for uh, all, all uh, peace av advocates to connect their issues to this burning issue. The people have spoken. This is the issue of the moment. At least that is my view. Um, now, we uh, the war in, in Gaza can go nuclear, right? This is a conference about nuclear disarmament. Uh, Israel is a nuclear armed power. If it is facing defeat, it has the option to use nuclear weapons. Additionally, if the war starts to involve uh, Iran. Iran is not a nuclear power, but it's sort of a threshold nuclear power that has, has a um, nuclear program. And uh, as I'm sure we know, the U.S. has been trying to clamp down in Iran for many years and in, in fear that it would go nuclear. So there's serious risk of nuclear escalation in, in a regional war in the Middle East. And um, so that's another way to connect nuclear weapons into the war in Gaza. Let me just uh, close our conference with a few quick action items that we can take. Uh, first is we have two major nuclear disarmament bills in the US Congress. We have HRO 77 that was mentioned earlier when we were talking with Roe um, about the TPNW, the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We also have HR 2850, which is a bill that, what happened to my share there? Whoops. Whoa. Uh, I just lost my slides. One second. Third represents peace. One second. I'll get this back. Uh, There we go. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, second is uh, obviously we started a armed conflict with Yemen night before last, and this is a dangerous escalation. Uh, there's a link there that you can use to contact Congress to speak against the administration decision to escalate the Middle East war by attacking Yemen. Um, and as Trita Parsi said to us earlier this afternoon, while the Houthis are not exactly a group that we would cozy up to, they are demanding that Israel stop the bombardment of Gaza. They're demanding a ceasefire in Gaza, the same demand that we are making. Um, and the, and uh, so there's a close linkage there. Um, next, um, Bernie Sanders has a bill uh, which would which would um, <clears throat> force the State Department to investigate Israel's human rights abuses. You know, under U.S. law, we are not supposed to provide weapons to any country that uses them to violate human rights. But the State Department has always declined to enforce that law against Israel. In fact, it, they've been open during the current conflict that they have not made any evaluation of whether Israel is or is not violating human rights. And so this bill would require them to do that, report back to Congress within 30 days. Um, that bill is likely to get a vote in the Senate this week, possibly as early as Tuesday. This is a bill by uh, Bernie Sanders. So that's a meaningful way to, to force Congress to take a stand on the issue. 
And last, we have a action that will uh, call for ceasefire now and to stop sending weapons to Israel and Ukraine. There's expected to be a supplemental appropriation in Congress. Um, Larry talked about how Larry and Roe both talked about how the Congress has to fund the whole government, but there is a spe separate appropriation to send weapons to Israel, to Ukraine, to Taiwan, and and to practically close the border to immigration or so-called border security. Uh, that bill has not moved in Congress because the two parties are at odds on the border security and to some extent on Ukraine. But sooner or later, they may they are likely to bring that down, uh, possibly sometime this month, uh, in in some kind of package that will pass. So that fourth. Um, link there is a way to take action on that. I'm gonna put all of these four in the chat and I'll also include them in a follow-up email that Jonathan and I will send you um, soon. So with that, I'm gonna thank you all for your attendance today. Um, we face a very weighty situation, a very dangerous situation, going from bad to worse, and yet all hope is not lost. We have... Uh, a uh, strong peace movement if we can continue to awaken it. And uh, thank you for your attendance.